Hi friends, it's Dana here. Today I am in sunny South Florida and I am going to read you a story about the Everglades because we are super close to the Everglades here, practically in them, and I thought it would be great to share with you a story all about the Everglades. It's called Marjorie Saves the Everglades. It's the story of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. It's written by Sandra Neal Wallace and illustrated by Rebecca Gibbon. So here we go. It stretches as it always has stretched in one thick, enormous curving river of grass to the very end. This is the Everglades. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Before airplanes and automobiles, a girl in gold-rimmed glasses sailed on a steamboat to Florida. In a grove ripe with dimpled fruit, she bit into an orange, sweet and sticky. Far from home and safe in her father's arms, young Marjorie Stoneman shared his hazel eyes and a thirst for the tropical light. Now a seed was planted for her love of Florida. But it would be a long time before Marjorie felt the southern sunlight again, or her father's warm hug. After the trip, she trekked to Taunton with her mother, back to apple trees and snow. They lived with her grandparents and Aunt Fanny in a house with an attic window facing the stars. While the grown-ups talked, 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 Marjorie climbed quietly into the attic and read, read, read. Books became her best friend. I read a lot of things I didn't understand, but that didn't stop me. So did the outdoors. In the winter, she hopped on her red bicycle and rode into the forest to find a Christmas tree. In springtime, she watched herring flip-flopping in the Taunton River. Slow and steady at first, then whoosh, like a tidal wave, flapping against the current to lay their eggs. When Marjorie turned 18, she zoomed to Wellesley College. She wrote to Mother and Aunt Fanny about the mighty oak trees turning scarlet, but she never forgot the seed that had been planted when she was a child. As more seasons passed, 24-year-old Marjorie married, but the union failed. She kept the Douglas name and boarded a train, leaving her old life behind. Heading south, the train twisted and turned through forests of pine. While Marjorie slept, it chug-chugged toward palm trees. By morning, a tropical light, familiar and bright, woke her up. Marjorie's heart beat faster as the train screeched to a stop. She'd arrived at her destination, Miami, Florida. A kind man with graying hair hopped aboard and strode toward her. Hello, father, she said. And just like that, her 19, after 19 years of never seeing him, Marjorie hugged her father. It's a long time. There we reunited with no fuss and feathers. <laughs> Marjorie's father had started the Miami Herald newspaper. He asked her to be a reporter. She couldn't wait to begin. Two or three reporters is all we had. I was the only woman. Finally, she found her voice. It wasn't her father's voice, her mother's voice, or Aunt Fanny's. It was entirely the voice of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. She wrote about schools of mullet leaping over Biscayne Bay sandy streets shimmering like moonlight on snow, and how women should have the right to vote the same as men. In 1917, with World War I raging in Europe, Marjorie longed to write about the women joining the war effort, but no woman from Florida had enlisted in the Navy, so Marjorie did. I wanted my own life in my own way. Soon she joined the Red Cross and sailed for Europe, she wrote about refugees living in caves. They'd lost their homes because of the war. Marjorie gave them what comfort she could, warm pajamas and powdered milk. 
When the war ended, she returned to Florida, but hardly recognized it. Workers dynamited, dug, and drained waterways to build, build, build. Trains, boats, automobiles arrived jammed with people. Developers saw the soggy muck of the Everglades as useless swampland. Drain the Everglades, they insisted. Speculators snapped up the land by the gallon. Marjorie didn't want the old Florida she knew to disappear, so she decided to write about it. She studied its rare birds. She searched for secluded beaches swimming under the moonlight. She putt-putted along Florida's new highway with her friends, right to the edge of the Everglades. They fished for breakfast and cooked in a fire. Munching on garfish, Marjorie watched the sun rise, giant and orange, then flamingo pink. The grass and the islands of the hardwoods stood alone in the light and the beautiful air. But at 40 years old, Marjorie had never been inside the Everglades until she met gardener Ernest Coe. Marjorie, I'm sorry, Coe believed that Everglades had to be preserved before they disappeared forever. He read how much Marjorie knew about the birds and the fish. Would she go on a trip to help him convince park officials to make Everglades a national park? Marjorie couldn't wait to go, but having never lived outdoors, she packed for a party instead of a camping trip. (laughs) Traveling by houseboat, Marjorie meandered through the glades in a string of pearls and a silk dress with pleats as thick as the sawgrass jutting through the shallow waters. She spotted crocodiles swimming, alligators soaking up the sun, and the wiry roots of ghost orchids wrapped around the trunks of pond apples. She saw sea turtles round as rain barrels bobbing through the forests of gumbo limbo. Soon Marjorie was covered in mosquito bites. She didn't care. She'd fallen in love with the Everglades. The people from the National Park Service felt differently. A swamp is a swamp, they complained, swatting at mosquitoes. Where, the, where were the mountains, the canyons, and the rushing waterfalls? Who would ever visit the bug-infested Everglades? At night, as manatees slept under the houseboat, hunters sailed silently by, hoisting fiery torches. They headed for the rookeries to snatch egrets and sell their feathers for women's hats. Marjorie knew that the Everglades had to become a national park to save the birds, the plants, and the other wildlife. But without majestic mountains and bug-free canyons, how would she persuade park officials to love Florida's birds the way she did and to protect them? What if they could somehow fly with the birds? That was the answer, riding in the sky in a giant balloon. Up, up, the dirigible rose with Marjorie and a group in it floating above the Everglades. Below them, the shallow waters gleamed amber, curling through red and yellow prairies and sandhills of Zizaphus, <laughs> coiling around tree islands of red and black mangroves, arching across South Florida like the tentacles of a giant squid. It was all so beautiful and unique. For once, Marjorie had no words to describe it. Marjorie and the others floated, free as birds, while the throaty sounds of fire plumes puff-puffed to keep them aloft. In the late afternoon, the sounds of birds flying home drowned out the thrum-thrumming of the engine's flames. Sky became feathers, wood storks circled, egrets and ibis swooped and dived, Marjorie recognized all of them. 10, 20, 30,000 birds cast shadows against the pink sky. The park officials had never seen so many birds in one place. By the time the sun had set, they'd forgotten about canyons and mountains. Marjorie Ernest Coe and the birds had convinced them to make the Everglades a national park. The ride in the sky stayed with Marjorie long after her mosquito bites had healed. She built a curious cottage perfect for one person plus several cots. She painted the walls flamingo pink. Under its roof, 
which coiled and curled like the Everglades waters, Marjorie studied her house cats and thought of the Florida panther. Were the Everglades really a swamp? Marjorie didn't think so. How could a place where flamingos flocked and thatch palms thrived be swampland where water stood still? Marjorie had to find out. But in the 1940s, there wasn't much scientific research on how the Everglades worked. Marjorie asked geologists and anthropologists mountains of questions. She examined the Everglades much. Muck, wearing a hat made of straw, never feathers. She learned about limestone, sandcastles tunneling below the mud. 57-year-old Marjorie dug deep, deep, deep into her research and made a monumental discovery. The Everglades weren't a swamp at all, but a river. A slow-moving, life-giving river of grass. With these wor three words, I changed everybody's knowledge. Fresh water into salt water, pine lands into lowlands, from Kissimmee River to the Oka Okeechobee. <laughs> the Everglades teemed with life. It supported so many kinds of life that it formed its own ecosystem, an ecosystem kept alive by water that Floridians depended on. There are no other Everglades in the world. Though Marjorie wasn't a scientist, she made bold scientific discoveries. Using her voice for good, she wrote about them in a book called The Everglades, River of Grass. With language so lovely and logical, Marjorie changed people's minds about the Everglades. For the first time, they knew why the Everglades mattered. Wherever fresh water runs and the sawgrass starts up, that's where you have the Everglades. But the mighty builders from the U.S. Army had different plans for the Everglades. They straightened the natural curves of the Kissimmee River to control its water. The ancient river became a canal. They called it C-38. The Okeechobee became polluted. Birds died. The Everglades began to dry up. Marjorie was heartbroken. The Everglades were dying. And now there were plans to build a gigantic airport a jet port right in the middle of the Everglades, cementing curves where water flowed and crocodiles and alligators swam. Marjorie's friend, Joe Browder, Browder was trying to stop the jet port. He knocked on the door of her curious cottage and asked for help. But I'm just one person, she replied. No one would pay any attention to me. Joe drove Marjorie to the jet port site. One runway had already been built. By now, Marjorie's eyesight had grown weak. The stronger, bigger glasses she wore didn't help much. As she walked toward the runway, shafts of brilliant tropical light caught the corners of Marjorie's eyes where she could still see. She walked in this glow until a giant fence with a big sign stopped her. The world's first all new jet port for the supersonic age, it read. Marjorie knew that supersonic meant the end of the Everglades. She had to find a way to stop it. People only listen to organizations, she whispered to Joe. Why don't you start an organization, he asked. Marjorie was almost 80 years old. She was nearly deaf and blind, but making a difference had nothing to do with those things. At that moment, an ibis flew above her, their wings flapping like the sound of a thousand silken ribbons and raindrops tat a tat tapped on her straw hat. Marjorie became an activist. Every time it rains, we know the Everglades are there. She started Friends of the Everglades. Marjorie and her Everglades friends rode around Lake Okeechobee in an old camper. Motoring from town to town, Marjorie told the residents why the jet port must be stopped and how important the Everglades were to Florida. No matter how poor my eyes are, I can still talk, Marjorie said. 300 people became friends of the Everglades, then 6,000. Children and grown-ups, anyone could join for a dollar. Be a nuisance, Marjorie urged her Everglades friends. Never give up. The jet port builders didn't take Marjorie seriously. They joked that they'd give earmuffs to the alligators so the jumbo jets wouldn't disturb them. We're going to build the jet port, they warned Marjorie, whether you like it or not. 
but the governor of Florida and the president of the United States took Marjorie very seriously. They poured over a study that found what Marjorie already knew, the jet port would destroy the Everglades. Marjorie and the study convinced the president that the jet port was a bad idea and the jet port was stopped. As the years passed, people forgot about the jet port. Sugarcane farmers reclaimed the Everglades water for their crops. Land developers drained more Everglades muck to build their towns. Most of all, they wanted Marjorie to stop talking about saving the Everglades and its water. People must come to realize that it's all the same water, from the Kissimmee to Okeechobee to the Everglades. 93-year-old Marjorie refused to be silent. As mosquitoes buzzed and bit at the town meetings, she spoke her mind. Go home, Granny, people yelled and hissed. Butterfly chaser, they booed. Can't you boo any louder than that, Marjorie demanded. I've got all night and I'm used to the heat. Whenever Marjorie spoke, she spoke the truth, no matter how unpopular her words were. If the Everglades go, then South Florida becomes a desert, Marjorie explained. What Marjorie wanted for the Everglades was a radical, enormous, and monumental. It was something that only Marjorie dared to dream. What the Everglades needed, Marjorie knew, was to be whole again. The Everglades is a test. If we pass it, we get to keep the planet. After nearly 100 years of dredging, draining, and polluting, Marjorie convinced the government to restore the Everglades. They worked to put the Everglades back to the way they found it. It became the largest restoration project in American history. Engineers tore up canals they had built. They filled in ditches and gave the Everglades back its curves. Soon water meandered through South Florida. Sawgrass became submerged. The birds came back ibis and egrets and wood storks. So did the sea turtles, the crocs, and the alligators, returning the Everglades to what it always was meant to be. A river of grass. One person had made a difference. Slow and steady at first, then whoosh, like a tidal wave, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas saved the Everglades. All right, friends, that's the end of that. I thought that book was so beautiful and I'm so proud to be down here in the Everglades and I see it in such a new way after reading this book. I hope you do too. Thanks so much for reading with me. I hope you pick this up so you can read these beautiful author's notes and learn a little more about the animals of the Everglades. Have a great day. Bye.